everybody. Thanks a lot for showing up here today uh, to see me writing some YAML. My name is Alberto Rios and I'm a software engineer in the Sprint team, now part of the VMware family. And over the past couple of years, I have been working on building developer tools for a platform as a service called Cloud Foundry. And recently, our team started taking a look at the Kubernetes world to start thinking how the products we build should look like over there or if they made any sense at all. It's been a learning curve for us. So my hope is to share some of the knowledge we have gathered over the past few months and share them with you all. Why this is important? Because when using a platform as a service, deploying to production is just one CLI command away from you. Uh, all the complexity is hidden from us if we are willing to structure our application in a specific way. So in Cloud Foundry, it is something like CF push to deploy to production. In Google App Engine standard environment will be something like G Cloud App Deploy and the same for Heroku with Heroku Deploy. So in the Kubernetes world, things are a bit different, so we have more control, but that friendly experience is going away. For each step to take our application to production, we'll have different tools, which is great because it is easier to swap our component, but we have a much harder learning curve. All right, so because of that, I am going to be showing the ones that we find more useful. But before we get there, let's clarify what this talk is not going to be about. So we are not going to be talking about some basic Kubernetes concept nor the internal architecture. We will expect you to know and we assume that you know what a pod is and a deployment is and things like that. We will be talking about how to, pay, how to operate a cluster. That's something I wouldn't even know how to do myself well. And last, we wouldn't be talking about uh, how a continuous delivery pipeline would look like. And there, this is a longer topic and there are some talks about that. So we recommend you to look at them. And so we'll be just talking about the things that you need in order to get the job done. This is going to be the most important slide of the presentation because here you will find all the examples I'm going to show with all the steps to reproduce them. So don't worry, you don't follow along 100% of the time, you will find everything over there, plus a few more things actually. And let's just go. So we're going to start from the happiest places on earth, according to some of my colleagues. So we're going to create a Gradle project which is going to be using the latest Spring Boot version, which is the, the 2.3 milestone 3, that contains a lot of optimizations and some greatness when it comes to Kubernetes integration. I'm going to create an app called My App, and I'm going to bring a couple of interesting dependencies that we're going to need. We're going to be an actuator, because if we have time, we're going to explain how this integrates well with the props, and I'm going to bring Spring Web, because you know it is a presentation, so we need to return Hello World somehow, right? So we're going to just open that, we're going to unzip it, and we're going to just import it into IntelliJ. Let's see, okay, we have already my app over there. I'm going to do that, and after a few awkward seconds of IntelliJ indexing the project, we should be able to start with the code. Okay, so we have a Spring Boot app. I'm just going to add a basic REST controller, nothing super special. I just want to say hello world to see that we are iterating over it, right? A class, hello controller. And we are going to return hello. So we're going to say hello. We're going to say, well, we are in hello spring live. And we are going to return that when we receive a get to the endpoint hello. OK. If I have any typos, this should be OK, right? So if we this talk was about a platform as a service, this would have been the end. Right? This would have been the all we have to know, right? So we, we get to CF push and we will be in production. However, because this is not about that, this is about Kubernetes, we need to worry about a few more things. And the first thing we need to worry about is how to put our app inside an image, right? So the entity tickets to Kubernetes is a Docker for it's a container image. And as of today, the most common way to put to containerize an application is by using Docker, right? So there are many tools to get that job done. There are many trade-offs about doing that manually. And it is very important to understand what the good practices are around building a Docker image, especially if you want to go that route by yourself. However, as of today, uh, I would be using a tool called Jib. So Jib is a tool made by Google that helps us containerize the Java application. It comes with some Maven and Gradle plugin. Right? So it already contains all lot of the good practices, so it's very hard to get something better than this one by yourself if you want to do that Docker building uh, manually, right? So I'm just going to add this plugin to my project. I'm just going to come here and add that. I don't need more tips, thank you. And with this, now we should be seeing a couple of tasks that appear in our project. And we are going to be just taking a look at them whenever IntelliJ decides to sync them. 
So we should see two, uh, three new tasks about jib after the plugin gets configured. And the main, so there are three, uh, the two mains we're gonna, so one of the great things about jib is that you don't need to have a Docker installed locally in order to make it work. Uh, there we go, so I have jib now. So, but we could be, we could be using jib uh, locally or also on CI, which is one of the greatest things. Right? So you can just jib it and you can just create your Docker image from your CI tool without having to have Docker installed. However, just for learning purposes, let's see how that looks like. Uh, we're gonna go to my app and I'm just gonna build the image in my local Docker registry. Let's see what that does. So you see, it is doing a few things. So uh, it is created using this distroless uh, Docker image by default, and it is actually creating the entry point for us. So it just created a Docker image for us. Okay, so we just see we have now. Let's see, if this is sorry, the Docker images. We have now our my app image, which is a snapshot that was just created. It is 143 megabytes, which is not a terrible size. I mean, it can be better, but the, it is more important to understand how the layers are created in our application than the actual size of the image, right? Size is not okay, but it shouldn't be the main goal. Also, the base image that has been used by by Jib is actually one of the most secure ones, so you should definitely take a look at that if you want to learn more. But let's just take a look how the layers are split. So we can just run Docker history to see how all the images were built in our image. I'm just going to do this. And we see it has different layers. And on the layers, this is the one very important thing we're building an image. We ha have them ordered by the things that are less likely to change. More, I mean, less, the more to less likely to change. So for example, if we change a class file, like let's say we want to change the text of our application, right? We don't want to, we just change this. We don't want the whole thing to be rebuilt, right? We just want this tiny layer, which is one kilobyte, to be rebuilt, not the whole 100 megabytes, right? So this is why these tools, another one, the one that, for example, is, is going to provide in the 2.3 release, is going to do all that for you automatically, right? Okay, so that said, let's do this. So let's just push this image, because in order for Kate to download our image, it has to go to a registry, right? We don't want to use my local one, we just want to push the real one. So I'm going to be using Docker Hub, right? So I'm gonna just give my image and upload it into Docker Hub. Okay, as you see, it took very little time. And we go now to Docker Hub, we should see an image. That is over there. That was uploaded a few seconds ago, as we see. Okay, so now what do we have, right? So we have an image we have in our registry. Uh, we need to put this somewhere, right? Um, we are gonna put it in, we are gonna be using uh, locally a project called Kind that stands for Kubernetes in Docker and this project is great because first of all it is compatible with different operating systems it can work on Mac, it work on Linux, it work on Windows very well and it takes about 30 seconds or 20 seconds to create a new cluster on my machine it took about 30 probably because I had a Slack open that time but it's really great this is one of the main tools that we're going to have especially on CI on the new project we're going to be working on on my team this is going to be one of the key pieces in our CI pipeline for sure, right? And that says, so we have that cluster now there, it should be completely empty, okay, there's nothing in here. And um, now, so what do we have now, right? So we have an image, we have a, we have a registry, we have the image in a registry, we have a, we have our Kubernetes, uh, what do we need now, all right? So we need to talk about the elephant in the room, which is YAML. So we need a deployment, right? How do you generate deployments? There are many tools to do that. Uh, I have seen some that are great that uh, you add some configuration to your project, it will go and generate that manifest for you. But honestly, as of today, uh, my preference is to generate it, I mean, create a stack out folding myself by hand and have it in my in my GitHub with my project, right? Just when I commit that, when I source console it, because you want to be able to understand what's generating, right? I, don't, I didn't find a tool yet that I like that generated something in the middle that I will be comfortable with, so I will just go with creating it by hand, sadly. So there are a few ways to do this. So for example, uh, honestly, I mean, IntelliJ helps a lot, actually. So let's create a file, deployment, deployment, YAML. And this helps a lot. So the, the cloud, I don't think I have mentioned that. So I'm using a plugin called Cloud Code. And this helps a lot with not only auto completion, but integrating with a lot of the tools we're gonna see. So I will highly recommend. This is available for IntelliJ, and it is also available for Visual Studio Code. So I would recommend you to use that. So we can just say, I wanna generate a deployment. Okay, this deployment, as you see, it already scaffold everything for us, right? So we have almost everything you would need generated for us.
But still, I don't know why I keep coming to this approach of generating it, which is uh, using this dry run. So I don't know if you have ever have to use this, but you can manually create a deployment using the CLI, right? I can just say, this is my image, um, Alert, MPL, my app, and this will create a deployment for us, right? But we are going to be using two commands that are going to help us. So we are going to do dry run, which is going to do is going to validate in the client side that the thing we're going to create is valid. So um, without executing it, right? So this is going to create a deployment. It's going to uh, give us that deployment, but it's not going to create it for real in our cluster, right? And also we're going to be concatenating this one or combining that with output YAML. So what this is going to do is to create a deployment file and it's going to put it in YAML. Uh, yeah, it's going to create it. It's going to have the output as YAML file. So let's do this. Let's just pipe that into our YAML. And as you see, this creates the same thing, right? So we have our image, our labels, and everything you would suspect, right? So we could now apply our deployment file and see how this gets created. Oops. Okay, so we should have that there. And now in order for us to access it, uh, we need a service, right? So the same way we can create that deployment, we can create a service. Right? We see that this is running, so let's create a service. So we can expose our deployment. And I want to say I want to expose this into the port 80. And I want to hit the target port of 8080, which is the Spring Boot default port that you expect. And we are going to again use dry run and say the O2 is going to be YAML, right? So we are going to have that into a service.yaml file. And as you would expect, open into yeah because it's nicer. This is just a basic service so that got created for us using the labels that you found in our uh, deployment. Okay, so let's apply that. Apply F service. Cool. And now we should have everything over there, right? So what do we have to do now? So let's see that this is working, right? Like we could have messed it up very easily. Let's copy our pod. I'm gonna port forward our pod into the port 8080 because this is the local machine. Remember, we cannot access the external route. Mm, port forward, no, port forward. And without any typos, we can now see localhost 8080. Hello. And we say hello, Spring Live, right? So what if now, so also let's see, for example, let's take a look at the logs. There's a tool that we like call, one called Stern to see all the logs because it's color cousin. So you have more than one ad pod that is being, uh, that is under this label. You will see the output of it. So you don't have to be worried about actually hitting the same pod the same way we're doing here with the port forward. So I really like this tool called Stern. And well, what happens if now, instead of saying hello world or hello spring life, we want to just iterate over this, right? Let's say uh, we want to just do this and we want to see that. What do we have to do? So let's do it. So we have to go, we have to do Gradle, Jib. We have to Jib it again. So we'll have to go upload into a registry, right? And one that's in our registry. We have to do a couple more things, right? You need to go and say, okay, I want to, because now we have our deployment and our pod, and our pod doesn't know that there's a new version of the image, right? So we have to do a rollout restart of our deployment to tell him to download the new version, right? So now we see he's creating a new container. And after a little bit of time, we see how the new app is here and it's coming up. Also, the, the old app is actually being killed and the new app is starting up, right? We see how the new app was started and the old one is already gone. So we need to now go and put forward the new pod. And then, and then we should be able to see the new app, right? So this is how a lot of people are still working today. And I think there are much, many, many, many ways to do this better, right? So this is just one way. There are many things that can, that can go wrong, especially if you're generating the tags manually. Uh, Jeep help us a little bit, but it's, it is easy to mess it up over there. Also, we could be, I don't know, what, having the wrong deployment or restarting the wrong theme, deploying on the wrong aspect. So there, because there are many steps that we are following, it is very easy for us to mess it up, right? So there are better ways. And the main tool that we're going to be using, which is one of the, the one I like the most, called Scaffold. 
it's going to help us with all of that, right? It is a tool that works with our CLI as well, but we but it's very well integrated because of the cloud code plugin. So let's see that uh, live. So we are going to be using the, the same, adding Kubernetes support into IntelliJ. Again, you can just do a scaffold in it and it will do the same thing, but this is, I found this nicer just because, you know, I'm on IntelliJ and this is the tool I use, so why not using it, right? So automatically, it's going to know that I'm using a few things, so it will generate one day a file called scaffold.yaml, I hope. Yeah, we go. So we have the scaffold.yaml file, right? And you see we have our service, our deployment. It knew already that we are using kubectl to do this. It knows already that we're using jib and it knows the image name that we are generating, right? Just by adding run command. So what does this tool do? So let's first of all delete everything that we have over here. Delete our deployment. I'm going to delete our service because now we're going to run all this workflow through the ID, right? So the great thing about this, like I can just run this and it will do everything that we were doing before, right? For us, so I can just stop worrying about that. The logs are, you know, we don't need them anymore. So what is this tool going to do? It knows that we're using jib, so it's going to build our image using jib again. And now it is going to load the image of our, in our cluster and it will also create the deployment and the service for us automatically. And finally, it's also going to port forward for us. As you see, we have now a new port here and it's also going to tell the logs. Right? So everything we needed, a few commands, everything we needed, a few things to do. This tool is automatically not going to be listening to our changes and doing everything for us automatically. right? So we now curl localhost into this port we see how we have again hello iterate, right? So we make a change. Hello from scaffold. It will know that we touched something and it's gonna go and reapply the whole thing, right? So this is another reason why having a sufficient Docker image is very important because otherwise we will be eating all of the time of the network, trying to re-upload the image and so on, right? Also, one great thing that it does is automatically cleans up the itself. It uses some trick with labels to know that a scaffold was the one creating all these components and it knows when to delete them, right? So as you saw, now we have that there. And um, scaffold is over here, so we should see now, hello, scaffold, when the app is ready. Hopefully soon, there we go. So hello from scaffold, right? So this is actually much better right? now, right? However, reality is that we don't really have these two files over here. The reality is a little bit more complicated, right? We don't just have these two things and we want to have different profiles. We're going to be deployed to different environments and there are many things that are going to change, right? Depending on where we are. So we're going to do, we're going to introduce a new tool called Customize. Let's first of all do some ordering because I don't really like to have everything on my base projects. I'm just going to move my files. So I'm going to move from uh, my deployment to that case and I'm going to move my service to that. Kate, okay, let's see, we have everything over here. Okay, I have everything here. So I'm gonna be using a tool called Customize. I haven't shown the URL, but this tool help us uh, without having to touch our main deployment uh, or maybe our main YAMLs. We will be able to apply some configuration on top of them, which is pretty great because you know, not only that, it's also help us uh, importing some YAML fragments to use uh, across multiple projects, like for example, the labels, or for example, some probes, or for example, some basic things that all the projects we have use. You can just import this configuration without having to do anything. And the main reason why I like them are the overlays, because you can have an overlay that you say, oh, I want to apply this configuration for development, and I want to apply this configuration for production, right? So let's see how that gets created. So I'm going to create a file called uh, customization.yaml and I'm going to add customize, edit, and a resource and I'm going to add my service and I'm going to add my deployment and now we should have our customization file there as you see there's nothing super special about it we could have done it by hand but I don't like to generate YAML, right? and also one interesting thing that this customize instead of you applying a file you can apply a customization however uh, I don't like to use this one because it's not a real 
uh, it's not a plugin, it is an embedded version, right? So I ha had problems where I was using the latest version of my, of my CLI tool and the embedded version on this one, on the kubectl CLI was a different one. So things were failing while invoking through here or while invoking through the CLI. So I decided never to do this. What I just do is customize build dot, right? This is what I do and then I pipe it to as if it was a file. This is typically what I do. Okay, but right now, this doesn't do much, right? This is just going to apply and concatenate the two files that we had together, right? We haven't seen any of the goodness that this thing does, right? So let's create a new folder called base, which is the things that we don't want to touch, right? We don't want the, the deployment.yaml, we don't want the customization and the service. Those are the things that we don't want to touch, right? So this is going to live now in our base. And we are going to create something, some folders called overlays. Overlays, okay, on overlays for development and one over there for production okay so we have all that there and because it is very boring to see me typing all that I'm just gonna go and copy from a backup I have if I can find it I'm just gonna copy the all the overlays because it's kind of boring and there's not a lot of value on see me typing those so I'm gonna just copy the loads my backup for development, so I'm going to copy all my development overlays into development overlays. And the same for production. I'm going to just copy this production and production. Just because there's not much value, you see me typing by hand. Okay, so we have now all the replicas. You see, we have all the overlays here and there. Let's see what they actually look like. So it's good to tell you because it's much nicer to see them. So we have this customization file on development that says I want to take as a base what I have on my base folder and I want to apply these two patches. I want to apply a replicas patches and a profiles patches and also I want every object that you create to be uh, prefixed by uh, the word development dash and then we go to production and we leave them we see that we do the same thing but without the name prefix right and so what does this profile do? In development, we want to apply the Spring Profile development. So this is this could not be only just this. You can do many other things, like for example, like creating a config map or just adding things that are going to be used by all the overlays, right? Like for example, the probes that you want to have some proper probes that are using the actuators in for health, and that's going to be all used by all of them, right? So you can just add that as an overlay that all of them are imported, right? But in this case, I'm just testing with development and production. And we see the profile, right? We see in depth we want to have development. In production, we want to have an overlay for production. Same for the replicas. So in development, we want just one replica. In production, five replicas. OK. So now we could be doing, so we could just say customize, build, overlays, uh, production. And we will see how the output that gets generated didn't apply it yet, because we want to use it with customize, really. Um, I mean with Kaffel. So what this does right now is just concatenating the two files, but we see how it applied the five replicas and it also apply the environment variable that we specified, right? So again, we don't want to be applying things manually by hand. We want a tool that integrates with this well, right? So Scaffold has an option. Before we were saying, I want to use kubectl to deploy my manifest. Now I don't want to do this. Now what I want to do is to use customize, right? And customize help us saying, with past we want to apply. Before it used to be just one. Now we can have finally an array of past to apply. So we are going to be using the base. And um, next, so this is going to be just now, if we just run this, it's going to apply the base, but we want to be using profiles, right? So customize also provides some profiles that we're going to be using to match our development and our production profile. So we are going to be development, and we do well. So we're going to deploy what we're going to deploy with customize and our paths. And this is going to be just one, which is going to be Kate's overlays and development. And we want to do the same for production, right? So let's just copy this and say instead of development, when I use production. So IntelliJ as well uh, has this configuration over here. So we see development profile default, and we can be using development and production. So let's see what production will look like. Let's see if they have anything running before I have anything. Okay, I have a few things that I shouldn't have. Let's delete everything just to see everything clear. Oh. All right, now we're empty. So let's see what happens when we run the production profile. And um, it shouldn't be a surprise 
that we are going to have five replicas without anything interesting there. And our service is being created, right? So you see now how the logs are here, and we have the logs for all the apps, the stern logs as well. And you see how they are color coded. You can see how all the five instances are coming up, right? And this is all without leaving our IDE, right? So again, if we just want to modify something, hello, I can happily iterate over here. All right, and then the ticket will be changed. Okay, so that said, uh, this is all I had actually for today. So it was only a half an hour presentation. So there are many other tools out there that are very useful, like KApp, for example, that might be a big benefit for your project, but uh, they may not integrate that well with all this stack. So we have shown just a tiny set of tools that integrate very well all together, right? So if you have any other tools that you think would integrate well with this stack, I would love to know. So please let me know through Twitter or through the chat app. And I'm super happy to take any of the questions you have around here and on Twitter. So thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Alberto. Alberto, you're still around, aren't you? So we can do some Q&A. But fabulous presentation there i saw what you were doing with things like scaffold and uh customize blew my mind my friends because uh I, I i've not spent much time in that space recently and to see the sorts of things that you can achieve there they look awesome right do you enjoy using those tools yeah, it looks much better now than what it used to be, right? Because before, like before we didn't have, for example, G for any other tagging tools, it was very easy to mess things up. And there are many points where you can go wrong and it was very time consuming as well to iterate. There are a few tiny tools. One of the questions that was asked on the Q&A is like, can I use a spin dev tools without reloading to do the whole reloading directly to the cluster? And you cannot do this with this setup, but there's a tool called Octito that does that, right? You have to install something in your development cluster, which is not super ideal some of the times, but you can have a really nice developer experience now on Kate, right? You don't have to wait for all this time to be pushed, read a load and put the image and so on. So the experience is getting much, much better nowadays. And apologies if I missed it, but what's your preferred local Kubernetes environment? Is it uh, regular uh, Kubernetes or Docker, or is it something else like, I don't know, uh, M3S? For the tools okay. I am been, uh, having to develop, I'm using Kine, which is Kubernetes in Docker, which is uh, honestly, because it's easy to start a cluster, it just takes about 30, 30 seconds, depends on what you have open on your laptop. And right. that has been all I need, but if you need something more complex that like you need to do some networking on some proper, like for example, a like gateway apps, things like that, you then need to, I don't think any of the local development cluster you can use are gonna cut it. So I would just use an actual development cluster hosting in the cloud for me. So we just go to PKS or whatever hosting for development. Right. But locally, kind is your current thing. You, you're enjoying using that. I haven't, I haven't tried that. So uh, that's something I'm going to make a note of and go and take a look at. Because, because uh, yeah, it can be a bit painful, can't it? You can have a lot of stuff running in the background. You're basically emulating what is, you know, essentially <laughs> the cloud. So uh, things can get very bogged down very easily. So it's always good to hear from others about uh, what their experience is, what tools they're using. Um, I'm just looking through the QA. I think you've already answered quite a lot, haven't you, on the QA. But folks, if you want to have some of Alberto's expertise uh, help you out, then the Q&A is a place to do it. So go and click down the bottom there. Ask away your questions in the Q&A. Alberto, thank you so much for sharing all that lovely information. 